So um, I just uh, I want to give God some praise for that. With that praise, I would like for you to continue to keep Marcia in your prayer. She had a, she had a rough week uh, dealing with um, just, uh, she's, she's got congestive heart failure. There's no cure for that. As you get older, unless God intervenes, it, gets, it just gets more burdensome to have to deal with. And um, she tries so hard to, to do her duties with church and with home and with everything. And when she's not feeling well and she's not able to have a, oh, she, she has trouble breathing sometimes. Now, I, I know God can touch and I know God can take care of it. But the bottom line is, you know, he takes care, care of us for so long and then we die. You know, it's not like she's 20 years old and it's not like I'm 20 years old. We just get older. Um, a couple of years, I'll be 70. And I, I thought, well, how did that happen? It's just crazy. But um, I would appreciate your prayers for, for Marcia, and I'm sure she would also. Um, so this morning, we're continuing on our four-letter words. Today is the 52nd message on four-letter words. That means today I've been preaching on four-letter words for a year. Now, we've, we've took some sidetracks on different things like Easter and Christmas and uh, special occasions. We had a couple people come in and preach. But um, it's just uh, amazing. And I, I don't see no let up in it as far as God telling me to go a different direction or running out of four letter words. Um, so this morning we're preaching our second message on Legion. And last week you had the two Gospels of Matthew or Mark and Luke in your handout. This morning, you've got the Gospel of uh, Matthew. Matthew is the only one of the three that records two demon-possessed men instead of one. It doesn't mean that uh, there was only one. It just means that, for whatever reason, um, Mark and Luke didn't record it. But Matthew did. Some thought that perhaps it was just two different instances you do the reading, you do the studying, and it just it, it, it's not. It's one. So this morning we're going to read the, the passage where two men came. And, and, and we can't even speculate what happened to the other guy. I've thought about this a lot. Sometimes, um, and this is just speculation. You might say, well, why are you even going to say it? Look, I don't know. I just want to say it. Evil, like good... We're influenced, and most of the time we're influenced by those we run with, those we hang out with. They may be a good influence, they may be a bad influence. I remember my mother telling me, she said, I can tell you've been seeing that so-and-so, you're acting just like him. And I thought, I don't act like him, but she could pick up traits. So I thought about that second guy that doesn't say much about it. I thought, well, maybe he was kind of wired to do that which you shouldn't do. I mean, some people, like, right out of the chute, they, they lie or they steal. You know, and other kids, they don't. And I thought, well, maybe he was one of those that just automatically did some things and he didn't have a good influence not to. So he started running with the guy that, that we know as Legion, and he was influenced by him because Christ told him to go back and tell his friends, but he... He didn't mention the other guy. So I, I, it's just speculation. I don't know. But we do know there was two of them. So let's uh, start off with reading Matthew. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gardanians, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs. So we got two demon-possessed men met him. So fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? And that's interesting there also. I, when we sing the song this morning about um, the name of Jesus, what a beautiful name it is. Now, we know there's all kinds of Jesuses in the world, especially in the Spanish-speaking world. Um, but here, they didn't call him Jesus. They called him 
of who he was, his entity, being the Son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now, a herd of men, a herd of many pigs, was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled. And going into the city, they told everything, especially what happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. A lot of of stuff in there. So... They, they came out of the boat and start up the hill on their way to the village. They passed by a graveyard where they're met by two demon-possessed men. Now, I realize even in religious circles, there's some that doubt the existence of demons. Or that if they do exist, they cannot control a man. Well, the case before us presents just the opposite. And that's why it behooves us, very important, that we allow the Word of God to influence our heart and our mind. Because you're going to be influenced by one or the other. And if you allow this world to influence you, then you may just be opening yourself up to the adversary being able to control you. Now, I can't do it without your consent, so to speak. Not only do demons exist, but they, through their influence, can control the actions of the individual. The scriptures, the Bible, present varying degrees of demonic influence and or control. I think it's very important that we, that we think about this. I know a lot of times we don't. But they're out there. Some people say that the, that the devil, he attends more church services than any Christian ever thought about. Why is he here? He's not here after God. He's not here after Jesus. He knows that's that's futile. But not every one of us in here are totally influenced by the things of God or by the Word of God. There's other things that influence us. So he's looking for a foothold. He's looking for an opportunity to convince you that you need to do things somewhat differently. And he won't even come out and, and bash church over it. It'll just come out and cause you to think, you know, this isn't really all that important. Demons cannot possess in the sense of own, but they can influence, and to the degree they influence, they control. In the book of Psalms and in the book of 1 Corinthians, it points out that demons are the power behind false religions. There are churches right now gathering underneath their rainbow flag and speaking all types of hypocrisy to people that are being influenced by the devil that if you you stand or lean a certain way, then you're not tolerant and it's hate-filled speech. Like I said, the, the devil... He isn't out to just tear it down in a way that's obvious. But he wants to influence. If he can influence, he can control. If he can control, he can cause Christendom to be split right down the middle. Denominations that that have gotten along for hundreds of years, all of a sudden, they break apart. He's very 
crafty and skillful at what he does. And you're no match for him. That's why you need to be influenced by the Word of God. To a fault, you need to be influenced by the Word of God. Paul warns in Timothy, and these scriptures, I, I don't have them wrote down, but I do want you to, uh, to read these when you get a chance this week. Paul warns about a demonic influence in the church through false teachers who pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So I'm not making this up. In the very early church, Paul warns them about deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Paul mentions specifically two such doctrines in that passage, forbidding marriage and abstaining from foods for religious reasons. Now, you might think, well, that don't seem like that big a deal. It doesn't take that much to divide the church. It doesn't take that much to divide Christians from the influence of God. And if food offered on the idols can be something that demons get involved with and cause divisions amongst God's people, how much more so do you think the demons have influenced the apostasy of the churches today that say it's okay for men to marry men or women to marry women when in the beginning it was not so, and it's not so today according to Scripture. You can see the footprints of the devil all over that. And we ought not be surprised by it. The demonic activity is as active today as it was in the time of Christ. And all we have to do is to look at the, the increase of false religions, cults, and apostasy in the professing church. It's almost like institutions of religious training are falling like dominoes under the guise of godly teaching. Demons can cause both mental and physical illness. In Matthew, in the 17th chapter, we find a boy that was suicidal because of demon activity. Now, that's, a, that's something we're going to be looking at and perhaps next week. How is it possible for a demon to possess a child and cause the child to become suicidal? But that's exactly what happened. Coming back to our text this morning, we find these men are very disturbed. Mentally disturbed, disturbed in spirit, disturbed in clarity. In Matthew, there's a man made both dumb and blind by a demon. In Luke, there's a woman that is physically deformed by a spirit. Demons can also manifest themselves supernaturally through humans. In Acts, we see where Paul casts a spirit of divination out of a girl that was following him around. In other words, she could prophesy, she could say things. And Paul, he, he cast the, the spirit out of her, and he just about got killed for that because there was men that was making a living at this woman's predictions. In Acts, we're told of a man who was demonized that overpowered seven men and left them bruised, battered, and naked. Demons are real. They are powerful. They are dangerous. But as we look at this morning in our text, they are no match for Jesus. So even though we ought to have a certain amount of respect for their activity, as far as, in other words, it's, it's like an electric, it's dangerous if you don't know what you're doing with it. But we don't want to get so scared that we don't want to turn a light switch on. Neither do we want to get so scared that we don't realize that if we're influenced by the things of God, the demons of this world, the darkness of their thoughts and their intent are no match for you, 
because you're likened unto Jesus. That's why it's important that we don't allow self to get in the way when it comes to um, how we live our lives, how we respond to folks, how we talk, how we fellowship. Like I said, the, the devil, he, he's more faithful in his attendance than any Christian is. So our text tells us these men, they're coming out of the tombs. And they were so mentally disturbed by the demons that they were actually living in the graveyard. That's, that's where they lived. I, I can't imagine that. Matthew tells us that they were so exceedingly violent that no one could pass by that road anymore. The people in the area were afraid of these men. And with good reason. Mark and Luke, they only talk about one of these men, describe him in more detail. Mark, the fifth chapter, he says, No one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. They tried to capture this man and in his attacks on the people in the area, but it, but it proved futile. He was, he was too strong for the chains that they tried to bind him with. Mark and Luke also describe some of his mental derangement. Luke says he had not put on any clothing for a long time. And Mark says, and constantly, day and night, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. And we looked at that in somewhat in some detail last week. As Jesus and disciples, they're going by the graveyard, these demonized men, they come out of the tombs, and they come before Jesus, crying out. Now, they they wasn't coming to attack Jesus and his disciples like they did others that passed that way, but they recognized who this Jesus was. And they said, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now, it was not the men so much as the demons inside them that were saying this. The men did not know that Jesus was the son of God. But the demons did. Demons are fallen angels. So when we look at that, as we said last week, Christ was very familiar with them, and they were very familiar with the Son of God. They're fallen angels. They were rebellious spirits, and they recognized Jesus. Now, that's why you and I ought not be alarmed when we're walking as we ought to in the Spirit according to the Word of God, because the same devils that recognize Jesus recognizes Jesus in you, which gives you power, which ought to give you confidence, and you ought not be afraid. I've not been giving you a spirit of a coward, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I, I venture to say this morning, you need that, that power. You need that sound mind. You need that love. And the devils, they know counterfeits. Are you a secret agent Christian? Are you a counterfeit? Is the devil able to say, I know so-and-so, so-and-so, and -and -and so-and-so, but who are you? See, the devil recognizes. Demons have better theology than some preachers. James tells us that they believe there is one God, and they shudder because of it. Here we find these demons wondering what what Jesus was going to do with them. I mean, they're in trouble. They've been had. They're wondering, what's this Jesus going to do with us? What's the Son of God going to do with us? And Luke tells us specifically that they were afraid. That they were afraid that Jesus was going to cast them into the abyss. Now, casting out 
the demons. At this point, the demons begin to entreat Jesus. In other words, they want to make a deal with him. And they wanted to treat him not to cast them into the abyss or to send them to another country. Matthew tells us that they notice a herd of swine feeding a distance away. And in verse 31, the demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. Sometimes we read these kind of stories, and it seems like, well, that's, that's back in Bible days. That has nothing to do with us. I'm telling you, it has a whole lot to do with us. It's in the canon of scriptures for a reason. Nothing in this text or in Mark or Luke indicate that why the demons wanted to go into the herd of pigs. It doesn't say why they chose that. Except they saw this as a better option than being cast out to wonder or into the abyss. Now, we know from Mark that there was about 2,000 pigs in the herd. These men had many demons in them. And now that they were about to be cast out of these men, they request Jesus to let them go into the swine. Our reading this morning in Matthew records that Jesus grants their request by simply commanding them, be gone. Be gone. You got that explanation mark there. Be gone. And they came out and went into the swine. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The first known case of deviled ham. I laughed when I thought of that, too. I just thought, do I put that up there? The first known case of deviled ham. After Jesus cast the legion of demons into the swine, we may wonder, where did the demons go after the swine died? I mean, those are questions. I, I wondered about that. It really doesn't say. Most likely... These demons would have then roamed the earth looking for others to occupy. Looking for others to occupy. Now, again, if you're a child of God, and the word of God is your, your faith, your practice, your hope, you don't have to worry. They, they, there could be thousands of demons all around you, but they cannot penetrate the defense of the Holy Spirit. No way. The Bible talks about that, about being protected by a garrison of angels around about our hearts. We belong to God. We're special to God. We're peculiar to God. We've been purchased by God, and he's got us encircled by his protection. So even though we recognize the existence of the demon world, we do not have to be afraid of the demon world. God's got you. He purchased you on a cross by his blood. You're special to him. Don't allow the evil in this world to influence you to where it can control you. Can Christians be controlled? I think we can uh, I think we can get to the place where God's not calling the shots anymore because we misstep. And I think we need to be very, very careful about that. Let the word of God be the thing that guides you through this life. More than anything else, the word of God. Not your church, not your pastor, not that they can't but it needs to line up with the Word of God. The Bible doesn't tell us much, tell us as much as we'd like to know about how 
these things work. But it does give us a clear warning is not to open ourselves up to the evil influence. And again, we need to take these warnings to heart. We had some responses here after the uh, Jesus was done. Uh, Matthew tells us, and the herdsmen ran away. and went to the city and reported everything, including the incident of the demonics. And behold, the whole city came to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they entreated him to depart from their region. So Mark and Luke, they both tell us that when when the townspeople arrived and saw Jesus, they also saw this former naked demonic sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. I wondered, again, it's one of those things I want to watch one day. I want to go into the movie room and watch this and look at it. Uh, What was it about the man sitting at the feet of Jesus that impressed his former friends and townsfolks that he was in his right mind? Because that's what they, they'd seen him sitting there in his right mind. Didn't say he was doing anything or saying anything. They just said he was in his right mind. They'd, they'd not seen him like that in a long, long time. They also saw the report about the swine was true. In other words, they probably seen the pigs laying down in the water drowned. And they realized what Jesus had done. He had cast the multitudes of demons from the men, went into the swine, and the swine went down the hill and drowned in the sea. Now, the Bible tells us, Luke, he says, they were gripped with a great fear. And they asked Jesus to leave. Mark and Luke tell us Jesus complied. Mark and Luke also tell us about the response of the man who had been indwelt by the thousands of demons. Mark says this, And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him. But he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Everyone marveled. There's something to be said when you get people to marveling. It always changes, for the most part, it changes people's perception it changes how they would normally do things. For example, on secular things or monetary things, we might see the price of gold going up and say, wow, it's hit new records, and you marvel at it. So when you marvel at it, you're thinking, maybe I should invest in gold. Maybe I should invest in silver. Because we're marveling at what's happening. in the last uh, oh, few months or so, there, there's been huge jackpots in, in the two lotteries that they do. And you marvel at it. And you think, I think I'm going to buy me a ticket. I think I'm going to buy me one. Because we marvel at that much money and how somebody's going to get it, somebody's got to win. I mean, it causes us to rethink some things. We marvel at it. So here, everybody heard what this man had to say. They marveled at it. And when they marveled at it, they no doubt thought, well, who is this Jesus? I've heard this. I've heard that. You know, it's been said he was the son of God. Maybe I ought to pay a little closer attention. Maybe I ought to begin to follow him. Like the Pharisees asked the woman, will you too become his disciple? Because he marveled at how Jesus healed him. 
So everyone marveled at this guy's testimony. Now, the man's response was obedience. He did just what Jesus had told him. Oh, that we could have simple obedience like that. I'm going to do just what Jesus told me. Simple obedience. Isaiah said many, many years ago, Lord, I'll go send me. Send me. I'll I'll be obedient. The result was that the whole region of Decapolis, that whole area to the east and to the south of the Sea of Galilee, they heard about Jesus and what he had done. And as the scripture said, they all marveled. Now this morning, we're going to kind of close this, this out with the thought that God, as an invisible supernatural being, who can influence men for good. That's choice A. Then we have choice B. Satan is also an invisible supernatural being, but he does not influence men for good. He influences men for evil. For Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says about the devil and the demonic world, that the truth is not in them. They cannot tell the truth. There is no truth in them. They can't even stumble and tell the truth. Their whole purpose of existence right now is through deception, is to have their party while they can, because the hour is coming that trumpet's going to sound. Christ is coming back, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then there'll be another group that will rise into judgment. And they'll be heading to a terrible place called hell. That was meant for the demons. That was meant for the devil and his minions. But it has enlarged itself for those who chose to be influenced by the kingdom of darkness. So what we want to encourage you with this morning is there can be no theology without demonology. That's because the New Testament looks at the matter of invisible, wicked spirits. And the writers took it very seriously because the Holy Ghost inspired them to write about these these instances. Next week, if you want to do some reading on it, unless God changes my thoughts, we'll be looking at the, uh, the child that the man brought him to Jesus to, to heal and kind of ponder the question, uh, how is it possible uh, for this child to be in such a situation that this family found itself in? And the pain, we're, we're continuing on pain, the pain that this caused not only the child, but the mother and father. Uh, Very real. And uh, we need to look at that and say, well, what what happened there? What's going on there? And we won't have all the answers, but it's something that we need to look at. So uh, this morning we're going to ask you to stand. I realize sometimes there's, there's... subject matter that we get into in the preaching and the teaching of God's Word that isn't pleasant, and it kind of leaves us a little uneasy. That is no reason to, to avoid that subject. Matter of fact, it may be more of a reason to explore that subject, to find out what's going on here. Was this a one-time thing that Christ could be magnified in those days as a testimony for us 2,000 years in the future? Or is it still possible? Questions we need to look at and come to some answers. Um, We're going to ask you to bow your head for just a moment. And talk to the Lord this morning about where you're at as far as being influenced by God. priority list of where are your priorities? Where have you committed yourself? Are you anchored in the things of God?
drifting, drifting on a religious sea. Dismiss us in prayer, and I hope you have a wonderful week in the Lord.